thank you all very much for joining us for today's uh, SDA webinar on working with Masters Athletes. Um, my name's Ali, uh, as most of you know I work in here at the SDA office and I'll be facilitating the webinar today and here to help you ensure that you get as much as possible from this great opportunity to learn about some of the key nutritional factors with working with Masters Athletes. Dr Peter Rayburn is our speaker today and he will take us through the fundamental issues and challenges for Masters Athletes which come about out through the ageing process. For those of you attending the SDA conference in October, Peter will be taking today's discussion to a more advanced and practical level at the conference. Peter is an Associate Professor in Sports Science at CQ University and has won various awards for his work in education. Peter's research interests revolve around Masters Athletes and Applied Sports Science. He has published both as an editor and as an author of five books, including The Master's Athlete, and he also edited the book Nutrition and Performance in Master's Athletes, published in 2015. Peter also puts his theory into practice and has had a lifetime involvement in various sports at high performance level, including winning his age group at the Australian Ironman Championships and placing seventh at the Hawaii Ironman. The format of today's webinar is that Peter will present to us for about 35 minutes and then we'll have about 15 to 20 minutes of question time. Peter might also answer some questions throughout the presentation as we go, so if there is something that you think of as the presentation's going, feel free to put it in the question box um, and we'll ask Peter along the way. Uh, during the presentation, all attendees will be set to mute, um, but if you could also just check your, on your screen that you are muted, um, that will save us from getting any interference or background noise. Um, the webinar will be recorded and we aim to have that for you as a reference in the member section of the SDA website shortly after the webinar. So I would now like to hand you over to Dr. Peter Rayburn, um, expert in working with Masters Athletes, for his presentation. Thanks, Peter. For the opportunity, I'm um, I'm really quite chuffed uh, to be doing it, um, and I'm really pleased that um, Sports Dietitians Australia, who I know are very applied, uh, have asked me to do to do this, to just sort of educate the membership a little on masters athletes, and, and my aim today is to. Uh, so sort of a bit of a run through on the, what, what is a Masters athlete about, what motivates them, what are some of the demographics and then more importantly from an applied point of view, what are the key factors that from a sports dietitian's perspective you need to be aware of in working with this uh, cohort. Um, I'm also going to try to spell a few myths uh, around Masters athletes. Um, I heard Ben Desbro's name mentioned earlier, um, I vividly remember uh, seeing Ben over in Hawaii in 2005 when he was doing a, a caffeine study. Um, so I, a lot of people out there may know that I, I am a guy who practices what he preaches and I hope that comes across today. So uh, I'll, I've got a presentation um, that I'm going to run through but as Ali alluded, um, I'm a guy who does like to interact and I really encourage questions during um, and at the end. So in, in terms of who am I, I'm probably a fairly typical Masters athlete. Um, I'm an academic, um, I've, I work full time, even though I've just moved to the Gold Coast, uh, some might say in semi-retirement mode. Um, I supervise 10 postgraduates, uh, I do it via Skype now, um, enables me to, to have a surf most mornings and I get my exercise in because I'm about 200 metres away from the ocean now at, at Main Beach on the Gold Coast. So I'm a typical older athlete in that I work. I'm also typical because I'm a family man. Um, I have two beautiful daughters and a wife. Um, I, I'm a, a result of having two daughters and a passionate belief in the value of sport in young people's lives, I've coached both my daughters uh, in netball. And the taller of the two there is currently playing A grade in Brisbane and I coached her from when she was seven right through to playing A grade in Rockhampton. Um, and this is me as a coach, another hat I wear, this is, um, I'm again, as a typical Masters athlete, I have commitments, work, family and other interests and 
critically, um, I'm, I practice what I preach, and, and this was me finishing the, the Iron Man, which was a, from in the, the Australian Iron Man, the last one in Foster. I was a lot leaner then than I am now, but um, I, it, it was a stepping stone to get me to Hawaii, which was a dream that I had watching Wide World of Sports uh, in 1982 and saying, one day I'm going to do it. So I, that's, I'm a typical Masters athlete with family, work and, and my interest in sport. I'm, as, as Ali alluded, um, uh, I've edited this book which Ben, uh, Gary Slater, Greg Cox, um, a number of uh, Greg Shaw, a lot of guys have contributed. It's a fantastic book. I've got it open here in front of me. I, I don't think you will find a better book and more detailed book and more applied book that brings the theory and, uh, and application of that theory to Masters athletes anywhere. Um, it, it, it's a culmination of a lot of work on my part and a lot of input from very applied sports dietitians and sports scientists. And obviously Louise and Vicky's book, um, which will be released very shortly, you can order it, uh, pre-order it now um, online. And I've written the last G5 editions, I think the last four editions, sorry, the, the Masters Athlete chapter. So that said, um, what is a Masters Athlete? It's someone who trains for and competes in organised forms of competitive sport specifically designed for older athletes. Um, that's an operational definition that uh, all my postgrads use and I've used consistently in, in any publication. So the key things are that, that these people are serious athletes. Um, you know, we, they come in all different shapes and sizes and they come in different age groups too. So in, in gymnastics, and here we've got an 82 year old gymnast in the middle there, Masters Gymnastics starts at age 20. In track and field on the right, it's 35 years of age. Uh, indeed, in cycling, it's um, 35 for men and 30 for, for females. Uh, in masters swimming on the left, um, indeed, in that internationally it starts at 25, but in Australia you can be competing in masters swimming at age 20. Um, so again, it varies from sport to sport. But critically, and from a business perspective, I think this is important for sports dietitians who, you know, I know we've got a lot of academics, uh, including Ben and others that might be online, but from a business perspective, I think this is a fantastic market uh, for a number of reasons. In general, and research has supported this, um, that, and I will present some of this data at the um, at the, the Dietitians Conference uh, in October in Melbourne. They're very well educated. Um, they have a disposable income. They are generally middle to high income earners. They're, my extensive experience as a coach in Master Sport as an athlete is that they love to learn um, more and more. They do come in all shapes and sizes. Um, they are, you know, psychology 101. They're, they're, the one thing I learned in my undergrad, psychology 101, was individual differences. And critically, from a practitioner, clinician point of view, they come in with different health statuses. Uh, this will vary from, in, from even within an age group. You'll have different health statuses. You'll have different body compositions. You'll have um, different um, uh, pharmaceutical requirements as a result of that health status and we'll briefly touch on the importance of uh, the uh, polypharmacy that often is seen in particularly older athletes that might have health conditions. Critically, they'll come into the sport um, with different fitness levels. You will have ex-elite athletes coming back into the sport. You'll have those that haven't touched their sport since school and have now, you know, the kids have left home, they've, they've got some more time, they'll come back into the sport. 
but often they'll come back thinking that they're 20 or 35 or, or 30 and start going too hard too quickly. Um, so be really aware when you when you're having those initial consultations with, you know, what what's their training past? You know, how long is it since they've been working uh, consistently in training? Make sure you uh, document their health status. Increasingly, a lot of research in in a field that I have an interest in, and one of my PhD students is working in, is successful ageing. So increasingly we're seeing, and there was only, only three or four months ago a paper that I must drag out for the conference that's highlighting that, that even at a particular chronological age, and I know I'm speaking to the converted here, there are incredible differences in biological ages and not only ages but rates of ageing. There is a, a recent study that's uh, looked longitudinally at different rates of ageing in people. So be aware of that you know, chronological versus um, biological age. Critically, this is, uh, and I'm going to elaborate a little bit on this in a minute, that older athletes, not only do they come in with different health statuses, um, rates of ageing, fitness levels, but in really importantly different motivations. Some will come in to win gold medals. My experience in masters swimming, triathlon, uh, running would say I would be guessing around 10 to 10% might be focused on high level performance. The vast majority are in there for these reasons. So if it's fun, fitness and friendship. So many of them will love the social side. Many of them will enjoy connecting again with, with mates that have a common interest or maybe joining a club with friends or entering a triathlon with friends. But I really think a lot of people have forgotten that a lot of athletes highlighted by the, 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 the runners here, the sprinters, that many of them do want to compete, to hold on to past glories or to rekindle past glories or just to get that feeling back of all the hard training is paying off and wanting to win medals. I, I, I really do think that the downside of that in Masters Sport in terms of branding Masters Sport is that I think often we get caught, we see these when it's Masters Games or Masters Sport is promoted, it's promoted on the, the former elite coming back or, or the oldest, you know, the 100 year swimmer. 100 year old swimmer that is going to do a 50 metre swim in three or four minutes. I, I value that, the fact that Masters Sport promotes that, but the 99% of people that join Masters Sport are joining it for these fun fitness and friendship reasons, some enter it for the, the faux reason. So I, I think Masters Sport and this is something I intend pushing any chance I get. Master Sport needs to brand itself and move away from the former elite and or the very old. It, it's, uh, it, it, it is an enormous market. And just to highlight the growth of Masters Sport, here's some, some data um, from a Future of Sport document. Um, that's just highlighting the dramatic growth from the first World Masters Games in 1985 to the Sydney World Masters Games, almost a fourfold increase in numbers of competitors, highlighting that worldwide there's been a dramatic growth. Even within Australia, the Australian Masters Games, there's from 1987 through to this year in Adelaide, they're hoping for 10,000 competitors at the Australian Masters Games. Importantly, you can see that number of sports 
are increasing in terms of Masters competition. Just at the Australian Masters Games, they started with 35. Now they're up to 60 sports. I need. I can also tell you that it's it's big business. Um, Adelaide, Geelong, Perth, Hobart. They run these things to make money. But just if we look at an individual sport, and in this case, uh, one that I know Ben and myself have an interest in, in terms of triathlon, this is a fairly busy slide. But if we just look at each age group along the bottom and left to right is different different eras, if you look at the darkest, yeah, that's 2000 to 2010, in each age group and in particular the 25 through to 59 year age groups, the, the rate of growth is in the master's divisions. It's not so much in the 18 to 24s, it's the masters. If we just look at Ironman, I went back and looked at some re annual reports and if we just look at Australian cycling, from 2005 to 2014, the membership of Masters has increased you know, almost threefold. You just have to, you can see that by the coffee shops and uh, all the, the middle-aged men in Lycra and increasing, increasingly middle-aged women in Lycra. It's a, it's a great thing for, for physical activity and the health of the nation. But one of the things I, I want to highlight briefly before we start getting into you know, the, the nitty gritty is, and I was talking with Ali and Amari earlier um, before you guys came online, that a lot of, a lot of when we look at uh, masters athletes or, or aging people that become physical activity, physically active, is, is what we're about to talk about, that is the, the age-related declines that occur physiologically. Um, are they ageing per se are the, or are they the associated inactivity that comes with age and or the associated disease states that come with, with age? And again, the importance from an applied point of view as a clinician to make sure you know your client um, really, really well. What disease states have they got? What is their current level of fitness and physical activity? So a very quick run through, because I want to I want to get down to some nuts and bolts um, earlier uh, or later. But there's standard things that occur in, with age, and I'm going to highlight what research has shown occur in older athletes, longitudinally and cross-sectionally, that these two, uh, they occur in older athletes, even those that have maintained training in, you know, from their 20s through to their 80s. There is a, an age-related decrease in muscle mass and therefore you know, caloric consumers, um, consuming muscle mass and an age-related decrease in aerobic capacity. So therefore, in general, the intensity of training relative to younger people is lower, therefore the energy requirements are less. So in terms of overall energy intake, there is a, an age-related decrease in, in older athletes. And there's an excellent um, chapter in the book written by a lady called Mueller Byrne now the, um, the head of um, exercise and sports science at Bond Uni, and yet another former student like Ben and, uh, and Greg and others. So here's some others, and the age-related declines. I'll let you have a read of those. Now, Im importantly, to go back to the slide I put up about ageing, inactivity and disease, um, again, no one has looked at very much literature around, uh, much literature around, much research around masters athletes and bone density, masters athletes and calcium bioavailability, ageing athletes and skin synthesis. So. 
it, it, although there is increasing research showing that even in older athletes, bone density is decreasing and particularly in cyclists and swimmers. We all know that that's because of the non-weight bearing side of it. In fact, another one of my PhD students is working with a leader in the field in, in um, Finland, a guy called Marco Korhonen. We are actually going to do a very large um, study uh, with um, Measure Up, um, a guy that most of you guys would probably know, uh, Jared Meekin. Uh, Jared's going to help us uh, with his mobile DEXA facility. We're actually going to be measuring bone densities in a co different cohorts of Masters athletes, including those that have done resistance training. Um, because we've just finished another PhD student's just finished a study that's shown that sprint training done concurrently with high intensity resistance training, even over a three month period, has significantly increased um, bone mineral density in, in a, it's a small cohort of 12. So, but there's, sorry, I'm digressing a bit and those of you that know me, I can do that. When we're looking at um, fluid and electrolyte um, intake, again, is it ageing per se? Do these things occur in older athletes? I haven't ever read any research on older athletes and thirst perception or kidney function. But what it, if we assume that these two factors are occurring in older athletes, and I need to say the older the athlete, the more likely these implications are there, that we do need to consider the fluid needs. And for me, it would mean making sure that there is a fluid plan that the older athlete has. Critically, uh, if we talk about heat, heat balance here, um, sweat rates in older athletes that are matched on VO2 max with young athletes Sweat rates are the same. There's, there's a guy called um, Kenny, K-E-N-N-E-Y, has done a lot of work on older athletes and shown that sweat rates don't decline in older athletes when, they're, when they are um, the VO2 max matched. So it seems to be the decrease in aerobic capacity that might explain a decreased sweat loss, uh, rate of sweat. Um, and therefore fluid loss versus, instead of um, in, in terms of um, VO2 max. If, that's, if high aerobic capacity is maintained, so is the ability to uh, maintain fluids and, and sweat loss. Again, just letting people have a read of that. There is an excellent chapter um, in the book, in our book, on physiological changes and its implications uh, for training and nutrition, which I, um, which this is taken from. So again, we're looking at vitamin mineral implications, and again. Are these age-related changes occurring older athletes? Very little is known about that. So if any of you want to do a PhD, think about it. So now let's take a bit of a wander through the macro and micronutrients and, and have a look at the implications here. At present, the, the carbohydrate intake guidelines are the, are the same as younger athletes. And Greg Cox has written a great chapter in, in our book um, on this. So obviously, and you guys have far more experience with me than, than this, but are they, what level of training are they doing? What level of competition are they competing for? What type of training? Resistance, sprint training versus Ironman training? What volume? Is it 10 hours a week? Is it 20 hours, 30 hours? And some of the, the train, the Masters Ironman will do 25, 30 hours a week of training. How often? How hard? How long? What, what body composition are they? Large body types. So they've got large muscle mass versus smaller muscle mass, males versus females. So 
directly taken from Greg's chapter out of our book in terms of the implications for carbohydrate. Definitely some evidence even in older athletes to suggest a decrease in glucose sensitivity. So Greg's suggesting for recovery to have a, a longer low to moderate GIs so you have a, a longer sustained period of uptake of glucose. What about fat needs? And this is um, a, a couple of other names that will be familiar to you. There's definitely no evidence in older people that there's any change in the rate of fat metabolism. And there is increasing evidence that all of you guys that are applied um, sports dietitians will know that there is some evidence of some advantages in increasing fat oxidation with low carb, high fat diets. But critically when we're talking about older, and again the older the athlete, Be aware that if you intend manipulating this aspect, it, say in your ultra endurance athletes, your half Ironman, marathon, um, Ironman uh, masters orientated athletes, be aware of their, their, either their, own, their particular current CVD risk factors or their family history. Protein needs. Um, Another name that will be familiar to all of you guys, Mark Tarnopolsky was a contributor to my book. I was just so proud to have all these world leaders working with me. It was quite a quite humbling experience for me. Now, th this, there's strong research evidence here that there's anabolic resistance uh, with age and a little bit of evidence to suggest the same in older athletes. So implications. So an emphasis on your whey proteins and, and I have one of my PhD students that uh, we, we've got a review coming out in, um, in the, the, your, one of your key journals, International um, Journal of Sports Nutrition. Um, we, we have a hypothesis that the older athletes need a high, to be at the higher end of the protein intake um, for, uh, and again, particularly the resistance high, in, high intensity training um, older athlete, again because of that anabolic resistance and research, sorry I'm just backing tracking, the only research that's been done has looked at boluses up to around 30 grams of protein. So we've, we've done a, a dose response study looking at what if we take it out to 40 grams, is there an increased rate of recovery? And a large bolus as emphasised in point one, um, again the larger the bolus the greater the rate of uptake. Some other, other guidelines suggested by Mark and therefore based on evidence. That we can increase protein retention uh, if we combine um, the um, amino, the, uh, we can attenuate the amino acid oxidation during exercise and have greater retention um, during exercise as a result. Again standard, again for everyone in our field, yours and mine, smaller regular meals um, over the day. And here um, are the actual recommendations um, based on Mark Tarnopolsky's research to date and this suggested requirement um, for different sports to have greater intake and a lower overall energy intake assuming a percentage breakdown of your macro, macronutrients being the same. And obviously because of the smaller muscle mass, even though there's no definitive data around it, um, that we could argue that the, 
um, in terms of women uh, a smaller intake because of that smaller muscle mass. So moving along um, in terms of your micronutrients, another name that would be familiar to you and um, a guy I've, I've had the pleasure of doing a number of projects with over the years. The review that, that um, Jeanette wrote for our book um, is suggesting maybe not a need for supplementation except in those that, um, that you do high intensity and or long duration exercise where the immune system may be more compromised. So a, more, a greater emphasis on your antioxidant uh, vitamins. In terms of minerals, again, um, Stella Volp, um, help me out here, another name that will be known to all of you guys. And this is a really important point that I tried to emphasise earlier, that, that, that the fact that older athletes in general, and I can give you the results, we did a survey in the 1994 World Masters Games held in Brisbane. We had Around a third of our older athletes, we had about 8,000 responses, we had a huge response. We, we observed that around a third were hypertensive and were taking hypertensive medication. So it's just highlighting that to be aware um, of the importance of drug nutrient interactions and drug drug nutrient interactions and nutrient drug interactions drug drug interactions um, when dealing with older athletes and again I'm sorry if I'm pushing the book but we've got a whole chapter on drug and nutrient interactions uh, in masters athletes with some excellent tables I'm looking at one right here now um, to give to really give you some hands-on um, uh, data to work with. Fluid and electrolyte needs, I'm sorry, I'm going to backtrack there. I think my observations would be that in general, masters athletes tend to perform at a lower intensity. And if we just think, and all of us would have watched a marathon, participated in a marathon, that it tends to be the back of the packers that might be really, I want to finish the marathon, I'm, I'm going to have a, a fluid plan, I look up the internet, I read, I talk and they say, you know, one litre per hour, every 10 to 15 minutes, um, I'm going to take in, you know, a couple, 100, 150 mils of, of fluid and I'm going to take in either sports drink or water. That, in general, the older the athlete, the slower the speed, the less likely they are to be losing that one litre per hour. So again, particularly wherever they're based, if it's done in Melbourne, they're, they're, there's no need to be drinking to those guidelines. So the risk of hyponatremia, uh, that is low sodium levels and the, the, the complications that go with that are quite extreme. So please, um, I know I'm speaking to the converted here, make sure that you get your, your clients to trial their fluid loss, uh, measure their fluid loss and work a, a program specifically for them. And the importance um, of the first reflex, stimulate the first reflex with electrolytes, so you, you, so you, your sports drinks, the, the standard uh, electrolyte content of the sports drinks. Supplement use, and I'm, I'm getting close to finishing up, Ali, if you're looking at the, at the time here, because I really do want to get some questions. There's, there's only been, there will be another study coming out, because I reviewed it um, about three or four months ago. This is the only study to date that I'm aware of that's looked at supplement use in Masters athletes, and I need to emphasise this is track and field athletes. It was done in uh, at the World indoors in 2004. Busy slide, but if we just track it from the top down, you can see that around 65% use sub nutritional supplements 
And for those of you, and many of you do, will know that the data from young elite athletes, it's not too much different uh, depending on what cohorts measured, but around 60% um, of athletes, elite, recreational, or up to 60% of young athletes tend to be using the same. Interestingly, you know, what are we we're talking about? 70, 60, 70% are using vitamins and minerals. Um, I'm one of those. I use a, a, a multivitamin, multi-mineral every day um, when I'm in serious training. Um, I just put strong believer in covering my bases. Even though I eat a very healthy, well-balanced diet, um, I like to cover my bases. Where are they finding that information? Often, and again from an applied point of view, uh, a lot of it, you know, 45% of these athletes are getting it outside of the healthcare system. It's where they're, they're, they're finding their information and purchasing it. Um, one of my uh, current PhD students that wrote that review, and Greg Cox has been instrumental in helping us with, uh, with the project, so is Helen O'Connor by the way, um, we just done a survey of uh, triathletes across Australia and we'll be presenting some triathlete related data but I can assure you it's very similar to what we're seeing here on supplement use. And Ben, here's a wrap for your chapter mate. Um, this is straight from Ben's chapter with a couple of other partners in crime there. Um, that it's, it's this drug nutrient interaction, in this case drug supplement um, relationship that really needs to be thought about when you're dealing with older athletes because they do tend to be big users. Um, they do tend to lean towards alternative medicine. Um, so again, the importance and particularly in, in terms of St John's uh, walk there, and Ben's got a fantastic uh, table in his chapter on the importance of uh, knowing if people are taking that particular supplement. What about some ergogenic aids? And, and again, I'm speaking to the converted here. Um, you guys all know the category A supplements, um, so your iron, calcium, caffeine, creatine, bicarbonate, all approved uh, and allowed. So, but protein supplementation, a big yes for older athletes. Leucine in particular, um, increasingly being shown to enhance protein synthesis, particularly in athletes that uh, combine it with high intensity training. Creatine. Again, particularly for masters orientated strength and power athletes, because of that, um, the, the theoretical um, understanding, backed up by research, but still not totally definitive, is it the increased fluid retention um, that might increase the muscle mass, or is it the muscle mass per se? Um, but it, and the, the, again, from a theoretical point of view, this again a, a review in our book, um, suggesting if we've got increased fluid uh, retention as a result of creatine, it may help reduce the rate of heat injury in endurance athletes, particularly in hot and humid conditions. And as um, Alison was just talking, we were talking earlier, increasing evidence um, and a, a very recent study done with with rare and very rare bit of research done with masters female athletes, um, beta alanine being shown to have a positive effect on on high, during high intensity short duration activity. Um, in, in masters rowing would be a classic example because they tend to do a thousand meters versus two thousand meters. Uh, so beta alanine during rowing would be a very strong implication uh, based on current evidence. And because of the, the negative side effects of a, of a big one-off dose of beta alanine, uh, th there's increasing research evidence to suggest smaller doses um, over the day or a slow release um, tablet. And, and getting close to wrapping up guys, because I really do want to get some questions. Um, just, this is just one of many um, 
um, you know, the drugs, the effect, the nutrients affected, and I strongly encourage and I'm more than happy to, uh, to share a chapter um, with you if you just contact me directly. Um, please, these just some examples, but again, because we know that older athletes tend to be have poorer health status, tend to be taking more um, drugs because of that health status, that it's going to affect nutrient uh, um, um, absorption and or uh, intake. So Ali and uh, Mari, I'm, I'm finished and I would really encourage, I'd love to be able to see people but I can't, but uh, I'd love some questions please. I'll be disappointed if I don't get some. Oh, last thing, last little push on the book, um, but I'd love some questions and comments please. Thanks Peter, it's Ali. That was um, fantastic, heaps of interesting stuff and I've got thousands of notes written down here so thank you very much. Um, we've got one question and just to get your thoughts that uh, although energy demands and I guess energy needs are lower, there's a lot of higher micronutrient needs and perhaps that can be a useful selling point that we can use to say, hey, you need a sports dietitian, but from your experience, how do you um, go about educating um, masters athletes to find that balance between you need less energy but you need more of the micronutrient side of things? I, I specifically, I always recommend to anyone that asks me advice, I do suggest a supplement, um, a multi-mineral, multivitamin supplement with an emphasis on A's, C and E. Um, uh, the other thing I always suggest is just move your diet far more to a high biological value uh, diet. So move towards fruit, vegetables, high um, ma macro and micronutrient intake. So uh, for me, it's, that is just common sense. Um, but I also do observe um, that older athletes, particularly those that are competitive older athletes, um, will be using those diets. Um, they tend to be very focused on their energy intake needs and or the quality of what they take in. And I also recommend good sports dietitians and speak to coaches and other athletes and or go to the SDA website to find a sports dietitian. Excellent. Thank you. And, and um, just a reminder, if you do sorry, have Alan, questions. If anyone else would like to input, I'd love uh, other people's opinions. I'm a great adult learner and uh, if other people have other ideas, including yourself, um, I, in terms of an answer to any question, I, I value that. Terrific, thank you. And just a reminder, if anyone does have questions, um, there's two boxes. There's a question box or a chat box, but if you could put them in the question box, that um, makes it easier for us to track. Um, Peter, one one question that I have is that there's a there's a perception in the general sporting community that at sports dietitians are only for the elite, and that if you're just going into um, mm. compete and and more at that recreational level, that we're not useful. Obviously, from what we've heard today, we can definitely have a role. So, how do you suggest that some of our members who might want to pursue this as an area? Um, how do you suggest that they start getting more involved and getting out there? Yeah, great question, uh, great question. Um, I, firstly, I think that um, it may be, well, I, th I would suggest Sports Dietitians Australia might want to contact some of the larger sports and let them try and brand yourself, sell yourself through those sports. There are a lot of sports now that, that have separate Masters Sporting organisations, for example, Masters Sewing. Ali and Murray that is right adjacent to you. You market yourself to those organisations, but critically from someone, uh, from a, a clinician working, let's just say in Brisbane, find that the, the, the best groups I would suggest would be triathlon group, um, uh, running clubs, um, the your, your local gym, the local Masters Swimming Club, Maybe just go and do a little uh, free talk or just go and have a question and answer session at the, with the coach 
who the coach will love it if you are prepared to give up an hour of your time to promote your business, to go to the pool, go down to the oval, uh, run a free seminar for an hour and simply sell yourself. Um, but critically, I think, rather than do the stock standard uh, PowerPoint presentation, do that for five or ten minutes and then open up for questions because that's when you will really come to your own, when you're able to answer and answer the specific questions that athletes will have and critically dispel a lot of the myths that, are, that tend to permeate. So get to your local pool, your local oval and connect with the clubs um, and or the, the groups and we all know they exist, you all know them in your own communities. Yeah, that's um, great advice. Um, another question that we've got is, are there any kind of common myths, I guess, that Masters athletes hold on to either from, you know, their, their elite days, you know, 10, 15 years ago that they still try and hold on to or the things that we kind of need to be aware of when going into those kind of Q&A sessions just to have a bit of a heads up? For, for me, it's the supplements. Um, I think you'll find, and the drug nutrient interactions, I. I would suggest if there's one area that even myself, I've increasingly become educated just over the last five or ten years on the importance of knowing the health status. I'm a very lucky man. I haven't had any major health issues. I had a prostate cancer scare and I got the bloody thing taken out and I just got on with life. But I, I've had a, a, a chronic disease free life. So I don't take any medications whatsoever. But vast majority of and I need to emphasise the older the person, the more they will be taking these medications. I think that their ignorance, it's not necessarily a myth, Ali, but uh, uh, the, uh, it's they will not understand that drug neutral interaction from an athlete point of view. I, I also think there's a lot of myths around in the older generation about um, a lot of the, the supplements and they will not know, they, they might have heard about bicarbonate, they might have heard about creatine, so the, 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 the category A ones, they might, they, I guarantee you they will not have heard of beta alanine, I guarantee you, or, or depending on the sport, that they might know about um, creatine. So some of these, you know, category A supplements, um, they, they will want to know more about specific to their sport and secondly a lot of these complementary stuff that you know you and I both know is pushed out by, with testimonials and marketers that, that they will take up and have a go at with no evidence whatsoever to back it up. That's, um, that's really great, Peter. Um, someone's also asked, do you mind just elaborating a little bit more around um, your comments on the decreased thirst sensation and obviously that drink to thirst versus drink to a plan. We all know that it's a really um, hot topic at the moment and I guess it would be good to kind of get your thoughts a little bit more. I'm going to base this, I'm certainly aware of the Tim Noakes, you know, push towards, you know, thirst, you know, drink when thirsty. Um, I, I'm, I'm not an adherer, I'm afraid. I'm, uh, as an endurance athlete um, of many, many years of experience, I have always used a plan and I stick to my plan. I, I, I also use sports drinks only um, uh, in general. Um, if I'm doing anything over an hour or two hours, I'm depending on the intensity with which I exercise. I, I just strongly believe that an older athlete needs a plan, but the older the athlete, the more important the plan becomes and the more important um, the event um, and the plan to that, to that athlete, the more important it is that they individualise the plan. So. For me, it means that, number one, most of them should be using sports drinks, but critically how much and how often is a critical factor. So they need to be doing their standard weight loss measurement 
you know, one kilogram equals one litre. You know, I'm aware of the, the note stuff that some of that is is uh, macronutrient loss, etc. Um, and uh, at the end, you know, you break down your your, your your glycogen, and you're going to get some fluid retention from that because if one gram carbide, one gram of glu um, glycogen equals 2.9 grams of fluid, etc. But all that aside, I I strongly believe develop a plan in consultation with your sports scientist and or your sports dietitian and stick rigidly to that plan and do not allow any endurance athlete, particularly the recreational endurance athlete, to use water alone because of that risk of hyponatremia. That's uh, very helpful and I think a lot of our um, listeners would, would agree with your thoughts there. Um, I think that I get to have the very last question because there's no other questions come through and that's around um, with the gut absorption. So you mentioned that there's less gastric acid. I just wondered whether that um, then impacts their tolerance for things like carbohydrate gels or whether you have more instances of gut upset or runner's gut or those sorts of things in, in these kind of Masters athletes. Yeah, really good question. And as as we all know, as people that are, uh, absorb all the research in this area, I haven't read anything to suggest that the older the athlete, the more gut upsets they will experience. In fact, I could even suggest anecdotally, uh, for the long, you know, the serious masters athlete who, in general, has trained over many years, um, I would argue that they have, through trial and error, um, learnt to manage gut upsets if they occur at all. Um, so I'm not aware of any research to suggest there's increased risk of gut upsets in older people, Ali, to, to put it, to answer your question bluntly. Um, and maybe that is an area for future research. Uh, that's Fantastic, Peter. I think um, you've just opened up a whole new lot of PhD candidates for yourself with lots of those other questions. Um, so thank you. There's no other questions from what I can see. So I just want to thank you very, very much for your insightful presentation. It was um, fantastic and I'm sure everyone got a lot out of that. Um, to those who joined us, thank you very much for attending. We really hope you've gained some useful insights to help you as a practice as a sports dietitian and I guess excitingly um, have potentially opened up a whole new market um, for yourself if you're in private practice. Peter, thank you again for giving up your time. Um, we look forward to hearing more from you at the conference. And um, if, if you want to get your hand on Peter's book, I suggest you you get a, have a look at that. And um, obviously, it's a great source of research. So um, we will let you know when the webinar is available on the members section of the website. And of course, don't forget to log your CDP points for today's session. So um, that's all from us. Thank you again, Peter. And we'll see you in October at the conference. Good fun, guys. Thank you.